Hey there! On today's show, I'm going to tell you why 1976 was a pivotal point in the evolution of punk rock history. I'm New Wave Joe, and this is my show. punk rock, 1976 is considered a year zero. Year zero is a theory created by Pol Pot, the Cambodian dictator who ruled Cambodia from 1976 to 1979. Pot was referring to a nation when he was talking about year zero. However, this concept has been applied to other things over the years, in particular art and culture. When applied to the punk movement, 1976 was a time when things rose to a new level of social consciousness. The landscape of self-expression, creativity, and existing social norms were challenged and changed. I'm not trying to suggest that years prior to 1976 didn't play an important role in the punk rock movement. I'm merely suggesting that 1976 played a more important one. Prior to 1976, there were a number of important things that happened in the punk movement. We saw the formation of some incredibly important punk bands like the Ramones, the Addicts, and of course the Sex Pistols. Patti Smith released her debut record, Horses. The Sex Pistols played their first opening gig for Bazooka Joe. And venues like CBGB's in New York and the Roxy in London created spaces where misfits and renegades could bring their stripped-down, controversial, anti-establishment style of music to the stage. 1976 was an important year in punk, and during this year some key things happened that brought far more visibility to the movement than had happened previously. Punk-oriented music magazines and zines popped up, In New York, the music magazine, Punk, released its first issue in January of 1976. Punk covered the underground music scene in New York in a whole new way by combining Mad Magazine-style cartooning with straightforward journalism. Punk also provided a place where female writers, artists, and photographers who had been shut out of the more male-dominated underground publishing scene could showcase their work. Punk Magazine may have only published 15 issues from 1976 to 1979, but those issues were super important in helping to define what punk was, musically, fashion-wise, and culturally. Similarly, in the United Kingdom, Sniffing Glue, an early punk zine, offered grassroots reporting of the rapidly developing punk scene in the UK well before mainstream music press cared to. Sniff and Glue may have only put out 12 issues, but its influence was picked up and recreated across the world. From LA-based Flipside to Australia's Suicide Alley. When you talk about visibility, we need to strongly consider how it is people learned about or heard these punk rock bands back in the 1970s. In today's world, if you want to hear punk music, all you have to do is jump on Spotify or pull up YouTube. But back in the 70s, these options didn't exist at all. Back then, the only way you could really see or hear a punk rock band was to go out to a bar and see them. And oftentimes, many of these bands didn't even record music officially. I also want to point out that many of us listened to these bands on college radio in the early 80s. But prior to the early 80s, There were no radio stations playing punk rock music, at least not until 1976. In 1976, there was a small handful of DJs who started to play punk on the radio, 
which certainly brought more visibility to the bands and the movement. In Los Angeles, Rodney Bigenheimer's show, Rodney on the Rock, began playing everyone from the Runaways to the Ramones to the Sex Pistols. Ladies and gentlemen, from the garages of LA, the Germs! New Wave promoter Rodney Bigenheimer. What kind of future do you see for punk rock? Well, it's going to last for a while. I mean, punk rock has always been here. When, when a truck driver went, stepped into a studio in Memphis and started cutting That's All Right Mama, Elvis <laughs> Presley. In London, John Peel started playing the Ramones on his BBC radio show, Radio One, and never turned back. Despite opposition, from management and some fans. I first heard the Ramones, they were the first punk band that I heard, and hearing them is similar to hearing Little Richard as a teenager, where it was like, you know, Saul on the road to Damascus, it really was, it was a revelation. Rather frightening in a way, I mean, I, 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 I borrowed the record from a record shop in Oxford Street and came back and I put about five or six tracks from it into that night's programme, and, uh, you know, you, you felt kind of threatened by it because it was so alien and it was terrifically exciting. Once this happened, 80% of the music he played on his show was punk rock. And, ironically enough, a younger, more progressive audience started to listen. And his popularity soared. At this point, Peel started to invite punk rock bands to do Peel sessions. A Peel session was recorded in the BBC studio and often provided the first major national coverage to a band who would later achieve broader success. The Violators was the first punk band to record a Peel session, followed by The Damned. Mind you, while DJs in places like New York, London, and LA started to play punk on the radio, this wasn't really happening in smaller cities and towns around the US or the UK for that matter. However, in Georgetown, DJ Steve Lorber started to play punk on his WHFS radio show, Mystic Eyes. Things moved one step further when punk bands started to show up on TV. The British TV show So It Goes hosted the Sex Pistols live in what's considered a groundbreaking yet chaotic TV moment. The documentary Punk was released by London Weekend Television. The documentary featured interviews with the Sex Pistols, The Clash, and Susie Sue, and included the Sex Pistols' performances of Pretty Vacant, Submission, Anarchy in the UK, and No Fun. And finally, the Sex Pistols and several members of the Bromley Contingent, which included Susie Sue, were interviewed by Bill Grundy on the early evening's Thams TV London show today. The controversial show made lasting impact and literally brought punk into the living rooms of many UK families. To further highlight why 1976 was a year zero for punk rock on TV, let's look at what happened after 1976, in 1977, 78, and so forth and so on. On April 15, 1977, Iggy Pop was on the Dinah Shore show. On January 6, 1978, the Sex Pistols performed live on NBC's Today Show. And on March 24, 1978, the Dickies and several other L.A. punk bands made a guest appearance on the sitcom CPO Sharkley, starring Don Wrinkles. Moving on to live performances, there were a number of historical live shows and performances that happened during 1976 that really helped elevate things to the next level. The Sex Pistols played at Manchester's Lesser Free Trade Hall on June 4th. This gig is considered to be one of the most influential and mythologized punk shows ever, having influenced members from other notable bands like Joy Division, The Fall, and The Smiths to start their own bands. Additionally, the Ramones' first two UK performances at the Roadhouse and Dingwalls in London on July 4th and 5th are credited with bringing attention to the movement in a way no one considered before. These performances attracted members from pretty much every punk rock band in London, The Clash, The Sex Pistols, The Damned, and while there was some rivalry-induced squabbling among band members at the shows, 
the realization punk rock was now a global phenomenon hit home. I also want to mention that The Clash had their debut performance at the Black Swan in Sheffield, 160 miles from London, on July 4th, the same night the Ramones played at the Roundhouse. In terms of festivals, a number of important ones happened as well. The Deeply Vale Festival kicked off in Northwest England in August. The festival only attracted about 300 people the first year, but numbers grew 3,000 plus in 1977. While the festival featured a range of musical styles, it helped unite punk music into the festival scene. Finally, the 100 Club Punk Festival was held in London in September. This two-day festival featured the Sex Pistols, The Clash, The Damned, Buzzcocks, Stinky Toys, Susie and the Banshees, Subway Sect, and Chris Spedding, and The Vibrators, attracting thousands of spectators. The event was a historical milestone because it pushed punk further into the mainstream. Interest in punk continued to grow big time in the way of vinyl records in 1976. While Patti Smith and the Dictators released vinyl records in 1975, 1976 is considered a year zero because there were three vinyl records released that year that are cited as the first punk rock releases to have occurred. Three record releases I speak of include the Ramon self-entitled debut album in April, the Saints debut single I'm Stranded in September, and the Dan single New Rose in October. The Slicky Boys released their first EP, Hot and Cool, in June. The Buzzcocks released a demo of their bootleg, Time's Up, in October. And the Sex Pistols released their controversial single, Anarchy in the UK in November. The final part of this video, the bands, further solidifies what I mean about 1976, because in 1976 there were literally dozens of punk bands coming together and forming around the world. Prior to this, this wasn't so much the case. You had the Slits and the Boys in London, the Dead Boys in Cleveland, Ohio, the Dishrags in Vancouver, British Columbia, DMZ in Boston, Black Flag and the Germs in LA, the Leftovers in Brisbane, and the Radiators from Space in Dublin. The list could go on, but I think you get the picture. Additionally, several punk rock subgenres and hybrid genres started to come about after 1976, such as queercore, hardcore, and pop punk, to name a few. I hope you enjoyed today's show and can see why 1976 is considered a year zero in the punk rock movement. Prior to 1976, even punk rock's most notable bands like the Sex Pistols or the Ramones could hardly pull large crowds to their shows. By 1977, punk rock had entered the public consciousness in a way no one had expected or prepared for. And this is due primarily to what happened in 1976. If you like today's show, please help support me by subscribing to the channel and liking this video. And tell me in the comments what punk rock year is your favorite.